This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. He poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. And his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. And so the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. Will you raise it up in three years? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. And when therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And they believed the scripture. And the word that Jesus had spoken. The gospel of the Lord. I want to take that as my text this morning from John's gospel, chapter 2, beginning at verse 13. We have a New Testament. John is the fourth gospel writer. I want to invite you to turn there. John's gospel, uh, chapter 2, uh, beginning at verse 13. And this morning I want to talk about worship as an occasion for doing something else. Worship as an occasion for doing something else. Indeed, I might ask, why do you worship and involve yourself in the life of the church? Uh, do you do it for the reasons that God intends? Or perhaps you've got something else going. John tells us at beginning at verse 13 of our text that the Passover of the Jews was at hand. Jesus went to Jerusalem. Indeed, the law of Moses designated three major feasts that every Jew was required to celebrate at the temple in Jerusalem, if at all possible. Namely, tabernacles in the fall, Pentecost in late spring, and Passover in early spring. And so uh, Jesus journeyed with his disciples from the Galilee, where they were all from, minus Judas, who was from Judea. Uh, and they went to uh, Jerusalem uh, to celebrate the Passover. In fact, this was something uh, that uh, Jesus uh, had been doing at least since the time that he was 12. In fact, you may remember the story of Jesus uh, in the temple uh, during the time of Passover when he was 12 years old, as it's recorded for us in Luke's uh, gospel, chapter 2. But John says in verse 14 that in the temple, Jesus found those who were uh, selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers uh, sitting there. In all likelihood, this happened in the outer court of the temple. He says it's in the temple, and it's most likely that it happened there. That is what is, was otherwise called the court of the Gentiles, where the Gentiles, that is non-Jews, were allowed to worship the Lord, to worship Yahweh, the God of Israel. The oxen and the sheep and the pigeons were being sold to Jews that had traveled from many distant places uh, for the Passover uh, celebration, uh, who needed animals to sacrifice. They couldn't have brought them along with them while they were traveling. But they needed these animals to sacrifice them uh, as the law required uh, the, and to do that sacrificing in the inner court where the temple proper was. The money changers were on hand to change foreign money as the Jews would have sought, Roman money and other money, uh, money from distant lands from which these uh, Jews, the diaspora, uh, members of the diaspora would have come to worship uh, in Jerusalem and at the temple, and the shekel uh, was the only uh, coin, only currency that could be used at the temple, and hence the money changes. 
And all of this happened in the outer court, uh, the only place in the temple precincts uh, that was granted to the Gentiles for them to worship. And, and then we read it beginning at this, uh, verse 15. It, it says that, uh, that Jesus wasn't too pleased uh, with all of this. Notice verse 15. And Jesus made a, a, a whip of cords, probably cords and different things that perhaps uh, those that owned these animals were had been using to maybe control the animals or lead them about ropes and such things like that jesus made a, a a whip of cords and drove all the merchants out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen if you're going to sell them sell them outside of the temple and he poured out the coins of the money changes and overturned their tables and he told those who sold the pigeons they probably were in in cages wooden cages uh, take take them away and then he says and it's in the if you look at the Greek, it's in the present tense. We would put it this way. And stop making my father's house a house of trade. And then John says, and then his disciples remember that it is written, as it was written in the scriptures indeed, zeal for your house, your house, the temple, will consume me. For the merchants, it was all location, location, location. <laughs> Indeed, for them, selling animals in the outer court, the worship space of the Gentiles was the best place to be selling. Uh, the, the outer court of the temple was just right next to the inner court of the temple. And so all a Jewish worshiper would have to do after purchasing, purchasing a, a sacrificial lamb in the outer uh, outer court was to walk through that outer court, the court of the Gentiles, where, by the way, the Gentiles were trying to worship, and 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 right into the inner court of the temple, where the animal would be sacrificed and offered at the altar by the priests. It was all good business uh, and convenience, uh, being a, one of the one of the key selling points. Apparently, the, 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 the sellers were are making a killing. In fact, uh, if you read the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus refers to the sellers as robbers, <laughs> which suggests that they were engaging in uh, price gouging with these Jews, members of the diaspora, who had come from all over the Mediterranean world. But while it may have been good business, however one might define good business, it was bad worship. They were selling and robbing, as Jesus put it, in a space set apart by God for worship. Indeed, in a space where the non-Jews, Gentiles, were engaged in worship. In fact, when you read uh, Mark's account uh, uh, of, the, of the clearing of the temple, uh, he puts into Jesus's mouth or records uh, Jesus's words, where Jesus quotes both from Isaiah's uh, 56 and Jeremiah chapter 7. But Jesus says to them, he says, is it not written that my house, it's interesting that the temple was often called the house of God. Is it not written? Isaiah 56 and verse 7, where God says, my house should be called a house of prayer for all nations. So clear reference to the Gentiles. The Gentiles belong at the temple. They've been given space at the temple for such, because of such scriptures and uh, as these. My house should be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. Indeed, it was this outer court, the worship space of the Gentiles, that gave true meaning to what God said through the prophet Isaiah and Isaiah 56 and verse 7. But these merchants in the outer temple were sabotaging God's intent, using the occasion of worship to do something else. And this uh, infuriated Jesus, sweet Jesus. <laughs> He was infuriated by what he saw, apoplectic. Uh, he was consumed with rage and he responded accordingly. 
Indeed, as our text says, that Jesus made a, a whip of cords and he drove out all the merchants, uh, uh, merchants out of the temple. He's, he's beating them out with the sheep and the oxen. He, he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And then he told those who were selling pigeons, take these things out of here and do not make my father's house a house of commerce, a house of trade, a house of merchandise. And then John says, and his disciples remembered as it was written in Psalm 69 and verse 9, zeal for your house will consume me. And so picking up at verse 18, we read, and then the Jews said to Jesus, what sign? They were indignant. What sign do you show us for having done these things? In fact, they were asking, you know, "What? But show us something to prove to us the authority that you must have to do such things as these. It's interesting uh, that, that um, no one interfered with Jesus <laughs> while he was doing this. Uh, the, the merchants, the, 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 the money changers, uh, none of them, none of them step in or interfere or, or seem to object. Uh, I mean, it was a prophetic act. And Jesus is, you know, threefold uh, uh, vocation of prophet, priest, and king. Here he's obviously acting as prophet in the house of his father. No doubt the, the merchants uh, and, the, and the money changers and, and so forth, they're, they're shocked. <laughs> by what's happening, perhaps even frightened. Uh, they're, you know, moving very delica delicately to keep from uh, uh, being on the receiving end of Jesus's lash. But then words, uh, word reached the authorities about what Jesus had done. Now, they were, no doubt, these authorities, the one who sanctioned uh, this commerce in the outer uh, courts of the temple and the worship space of the Gentiles. So word, word reached them and, and they were demanding an explanation. And Jesus gave them a cryptic one. Seemingly, he didn't seem to, 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 to care whether they understood it or not. And so we read again, beginning at verse 18, the Jews said to Jesus, what sign do you show us uh, for having done these things? And Jesus answered, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. And then the Jews they objected. They said, uh, this uh, temple has uh, been in building for 46 years, which was true. Uh, Herod had begun an expansion project and a remodeling project uh, of the temple on the Temple Mount. It had been going on for 46 years. In fact, it was still going on. In fact, uh, the historian Josephus tells us uh, that it wasn't finished until a six, uh, AD 64. And so it would go on for nearly another 20 years. But Jesus said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews then said, uh, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But John, in his editorial comments, said Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. He didn't try to explain, but that's what Jesus meant. And when, therefore, he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered what he said. And they believed the scriptures and the word that Jesus had spoken. And so what's the point of all this? And what about us? The merchants and the money changers engaging in commerce in the temple appeared, at least on the surface, to, to, to be part of the worship. But in point of fact, they were only using the occasion of worship and to do something else which leads us back to our initial question why do you worship and why are you involved in the life of the church and some go to worship to be entertained this sounds a little strange to me but i know it to be true uh, indeed, if I, if I were a true believer, I, I, I wouldn't find it very entertaining to go to church and listen to people singing about spiritual things, I, certainly to listening to preachers. But some people do for whatever reason, although I'm, I'm not so sure that the people who treat worship this way 
uh, are ever changed by the experience in any real or lasting way. They're just there to be entertained. I like what uh, one writer wrote. He wrote, uh, worship can be exciting or worship can be transformative. Worship can be exciting or worship can be transformative. Worship can change my mood or <laughs> worship can change my life. And every time I worship, I decide whether it will have a short-term or long-term effect. It can't have a long-term effect when I'm just treating it as some sort of form of entertainment. Others that go to, to church to socialize. It isn't very likely that they would call the church a, a, a club, but th that's pretty much what it is for them. They may not be close to God, but they're close to their friends. And the church provides them an occasion for them to get together with their friends. Unfortunately, I, I think that such people share, sell themselves short. In the Westminster Shorter Catechism, we read the chief end of man. Man's humanity's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. But that kind of experience isn't likely to be my experience. If the chief end of my relationship to the church is just to get together with my friends. Others that go to, go to church to practice a habit or carry out a duty, they, they might say, after all, you know, I've been, I've been going to church uh, uh, every Sunday all my life. And in fact, I don't know what I'd otherwise do on a Sunday morning. Or, or, or going to church is the right thing to do, right? <laughs> to which I'd say, yeah. Going to church is the right thing to do, and if it's the habit of, uh, if it's your habit, that's not a necessarily a bad thing. In fact, we read in the scriptures that Jesus went to synagogue, as was his custom. He was in the habit of going uh, to all the major feasts at the temple, and and otherwise uh, on Sabbath going to uh, the synagogue. But if all I'm doing is ticking off a box, then I'm missing the point. Others that use the church as, a, as an occasion for self-promotion, uh, to promote self. Often this begins uh, in, the, in the form of, of someone taking on some uh, key service role in the church. But after a while, who this person is and what this person does in the church fuses, and then the fusion begins to take on a life of itself until the significance of this person expands beyond all proportion in relation to everything else that's happening in the life of the church and addressing the problem which not many in the church are often very keen to do because they're actually frightened to do it often results in painful conflict and no want of unpleasant drama and in Jesus' day, it was the merchants and the money changers engaged in commerce in the temple who appeared at least on the surface of things to be part of the worship. But in point of fact, they were only using the occasion of worship to do something else. And so what about you? Indeed, what is the role that you are playing in the life and worship of Christ's church? Worship as an occasion for doing something else. Let us pray. When we put ourselves before you, it's easy to get things all mixed up. To have ourselves at the center where you belong because you're our creator, our redeemer, our sustainer. And to have ourselves at the center and you on the periphery. It's easy to get things mixed up, even in the church. And to make use of you and 
to make use of the church for one thing or another to scratch some concern that's on our heart or, or some other thing that might be a little bit more insidious. Think of the words of Tim Keller who said, anyone can find you, Lord, can, can find you useful. It's a maturing Christian who finds you beautiful. Lord, help us to find you beautiful. To see the place of worship and know exactly what it is that we've come to do. Or in our engagement in the life of the church to know exactly what it is that you've called us to do. And knowing that you are God and we are not. To know that you're the head of the church, not any one of us. And to carry out the gifts that you've given us to do in a way that they were intended to be used, as the Apostle Paul said, for the common good, <laughs> for the good of others, to your great glory and our soul's health. Help us to do it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.